My name is Mary Dardenne and I run a little company called Decanter Tours. We're based in Bordeaux, France and we serve all of France for wine tours. I decided to create a little video for those of you who couldn't come with us this springtime on wine tour, but anybody else who wants to come along, by all means do. We're all about education, so I want to start today with a little bit of education on Bordeaux, the Bordeaux region. So let's start with the history. Why don't we start at the very beginning? Who planted our vines? Unlike most other regions in France, it was not the clergy. Our vines were planted by the Romans somewhere after 46, 56 BC. The Romans obviously started more towards Marseille in the east and they slowly made their way west, conquering uh, different areas as they came along. They moved into the area called Burdigala, which was named so by the Celtic tribes who had been living here uh, for a long time. They had made a lot of money on the canals and waterways, levying taxes um, for use of the canals and waterways. But in roughly 46, 56 BC, the Romans moved in and they uh, planted vines purely to have something to drink. As we know in those days, the water was undrinkable, so they needed wine to make the water uh, safe to drink. So the area of Vertigala for the Romans was based on the commerce of tin and lead towards Rome. The Romans also brought in with them the Bitterica grape variety. It is a distant ancestor of our today Cabernet Sauvignon grape variety, but it was well suited to our cold climate. So we're gonna jump forward a little bit because there's not really much evidence of vine planting and vine growing from the first to the 10th centuries. We have found a few Cooper's, Cooper's tools and some amphoras uh, and things from the first century, but that just proves to us that we know that there was uh, winemaking going on. But wine in France was uh, domestically popular. It was uh, consumed pretty much um, where it was made. So it was only up until the 10th to the 13th centuries with the growth of the clergy and the building of lots of monasteries that the vine was propagated in our region. So as I said, wine was seldom exported and domestically consumed. Bordeaux, the Bordeaux region was really put on the map in the middle of the 12th century in 1152 when a lady called Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was the Duchess of Aquitaine, and in those days, the Duchy of Aquitaine was the largest in France. She was married to a Frenchman, Louis, the King Louis, and things didn't really work out for them. So she kicked him to the post, long story short, when she met a much younger Henry Plantagenet. He was an Englishman who happened to have been born in Le Mans, France, and she had met him while she was still married to, to Louis, not really done, but she had her marriage annulled and very shortly after married Henry Plantagenet. I call her France's first cougar. Once they were married, about three months afterwards, his father died. Well, his father just so happened to be the King of England. So when his father died, that made him the King of England. Now, as a pretty nice dowry, Eleanor of Aquitaine gave to her husband upon their marriage, the Duchy of Aquitaine. So when he became king, she became queen, and the whole of Aquitaine became English territory. Now Aquitaine stayed English territory for the better part of 300 years, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So it was at this time that our wines of Bordeaux were starting to be exported to England. If you think about it, it was much easier to export our wines across the channel and um, get them into England than it was to bring them across the land and bring them up to Paris. So in the Middle Ages, the Parisians drank predominantly Champagne and Burgundy, whereas the English drank Bordeaux wines. This explains the ubiquity of Bordeaux wines in uh, England. At this time, the vineyards expanded and things were going along tickety-boo. So things were going along just fine until the beginning of what we call the Hundred Years' War, which wasn't exactly 100 years, it was 116, but who's counting? 1337, the war between the French and the English broke out uh, and it was carried out in most places in France, 
predominantly in our area in the Bordeaux region. So um, this was the war which General Talbot, you might have heard of him, um, uh, he lost the war for the English. So the French and the English were fighting back and forth and in 1453, General Talbot on his white horse at the ripe old age of 80 something years old, he lost the war and France annexed back this region. Middle of the 15th century, the Hundred Years' War ends, thus ending British rule in the region of Aquitaine. The power goes back to the French government. Well, the English were very smart when they ruled this area. They had put in something called the Bordeaux Privilege, or the Bordeaux Privilege, which was essentially a tax break for the local Bordelais, the local people of Bordeaux, for um, anybody wanting to ship their goods through the port of Bordeaux, they had to pay a tax. Quite a hefty tax. So anybody from further up, up river, say towards Toulouse or Cahors, they had to pay a tax to get through the port of Bordeaux. Now in the Middle Ages, the port of Bordeaux was one of the largest commercial ports in the world. Who knew? So uh, while the, Fr the English had put in this tax break, in the middle of the 15th century when the French took over, they knew the people of Bordeaux were very loyal to the English government and did not really want to become French. So they did a very smart thing and they kept that tax break in place. And that stayed in place until about 1776. So for quite a long time. So 1462, middle, latter part of the 15th century, the French government set up a parliament in the Port Caillot, which is still standing today, which you can visit when you come to visit us in Bordeaux. At this time, wine sales in England had been going along very well, as I said, and suddenly the, this, the export of wines to England stopped. So Bordeaux is, has a series of uh, booms and busts, like any business cycle, you have your ups and downs. And uh, so we were looking for a new business partner. In step the Dutch. Now in Bordeaux, we love the Dutch. They're responsible for quite a few things, but the first thing they did was they became our new market in the middle of the 15th century for wines. Now in those days, our wines were predominantly white wines. They stepped up, they bought up our white wines. Why were they able to do this? One, they had ships, they shipped them out, they had colonies, they shipped them to their colonies, and what they didn't ship to their colonies, they distilled to um, make eau de vie because they were big into distillation. We'll talk about cognac in another episode too because the Dutch are responsible for that. So um, from the 16th century, we started uh, trading with the West Indies and trading sugar and spices for wines. The Dutch move into the Chartrand district in Bordeaux and lo and behold, the Chartrand district is right on the riverside. And they uh, moved in, built warehouse, imposed their architecture. You can see some of the funny looking Dutch buildings which look very different from the 17th and 18th century uh, French architecture, but they're still there today. So the Dutch are responsible for many things uh, and they also introduced the use of sulfur into winemaking. Now it was the Dutch beer makers who, um, when the, they were buying the, the wines, they would, on these long journeys across the oceans, they would turn into vinegar. And the Dutch said, here, why don't you try this little, what we now call Dutch match, it was a little tablet, of, of sulfur, which they burn in wooden barrels. We know that wooden barrels are very porous and they harbor bacteria. So they said, here, take this little Dutch match, and we still use this today, and that's another thing you can see when you come to visit us in Bordeaux, is how we still use this Dutch match. Um, we light this sulfur tablet, we put it in the barrels, we close it up, and the sulfur sort of fumigates the barrel and kills all of the bacteria. So this was introduced in the 17th century thanks to the Dutch. Another thing <clears throat> that happened was the area of, which is now called the Medoc or the Medoc Peninsula, which starts from Bordeaux and runs all the way up to uh, Le Verdon, which is just opposite the port of La Rochelle. That was uh, a swampland. The, the Medoc region is very, very low lying and very marshy. Again, a future, uh, a future cast will be on the Medoc predominantly. So King Henry IV of France asked in the end of the 17th century, asked the Dutch engineers, because the Dutch knew all about being under the level of the sea, he asked the Dutch engineers to come out and drain the swamp, so to speak. 
And once they did drain the swamp, they said, hey, this looks like quite good great growing territory. So what these rich merchants of Bordeaux, now remember we're, we're trading wines with the West Indies, uh, things are going really well again. The rich merchants of Bordeaux started moving into the Medoc region and planting, and planting, and planting. And so we had an expansion of the vines by the Bordeaux merchants into the Medoc region and other areas, but the Medoc was predominantly, um, it's what I call the nouveau riche part of town. It's the newer part of town because the, plant, the plantings in Saint-Emilion or say in the Grave region down in the south were planted by the Romans. So um, 18th century, we start expanding the vineyards and the vineyard expansion became so uh, vast that people from other areas started labeling their wines as um, Bordeaux wines. And the, uh, the, the vignerons of Bordeaux started complaining and that's when we created what we call the Vignoble de Bordeaux and we divided this area into a collection of districts. So from that point onwards, the, the wines had to be labeled with both the region and the area where they originated from. So the 18th century was effectively the golden age of Bordeaux and that's when about 5,000 of the Bordeaux buildings uh, were built, just so that you know that Bordeaux, the, the downtown Bordeaux area was uh, classified a UNESCO World Heritage Site, or some of, the, some of the buildings were classified World Heritage Site, and those are most of those buildings. So um, the 18th century Bordeaux became a vast uh, building expansion. Victor Hugo said, take Versailles, add Antwerp, and you get Bordeaux. Also, uh, the Baron Haussmann, who was a longtime prefect of Bordeaux, used Bordeaux's 18th century big scale rebuilding as a model when he asked the Emperor Napoleon III uh, to transform the still quasi medieval Paris into a modern capital that would make France proud. He based that on Bordeaux. So here we are up to the 19th and 20th centuries and it's all about disease and improvement. So 19th century, remember in the 18th century, it was one of Bordeaux's boom periods. We were planting vines everywhere. Previously, when you'd have a little farm, um, you'd have some chickens over here, some cows over here, some wheat over there, and then maybe some vines in the back. Well, after the 18th century and the, the lucrative wine business growing and growing, uh, people started planting vines everywhere. And what happens when you get monoculture? disease. In the end of the 19th century, 1875 to 1892, we had Phylloxera. Now Phylloxera is actually an aphid. It's a little bug who lives in the roots and it will kill the plant before you even know you've got it. So in, the, in that period, Phylloxera disease killed two thirds of all of France's vines. Now, where did we get it? It came over on American rootstock. You know, we used to trade plants and bring in tulips from Holland and vines from America. Well, the American rootstock is uh, immune to this uh, aphid. So, so it came in on the American rootstock. We searched and searched and searched for a cure. We never found one, but we did find a solution. Because the American rootstock is resistant to this aphid, we started grafting on our grape varieties onto the American rootstock. Now the rootstock makes no difference to the taste of the wine. So uh, that was actually a good thing because now we graft down onto the, uh, the actual rootstock and it means that we can drill down into our grafting even more. So we found a cure for phylloxera and then we get mildew and oidium. It took us about 60 years to figure out a solution, a cure for mildew and oidium. And there is some debate as to whether it came from the Dutch or it came from um, an English peach farmer or whether it was created in Bordeaux. Everybody has a different story, but it was uh, the sheer fact of using copper sulfite, a, a solution which we now called Bouilly Bordelais, or the Bordeaux mixture, which is copper sulfite. It's the same sort of thing that you use on your roses. Uh, it turns them blue. Well, it uh, avoids, it prevents mildew. So we solved that problem. And uh, then we come to the 20th century, which is all about development improvement and the creation of our appellation system, which had been previously started by the Baron Leroy. So in 1936, under pressure from, again, the vignons and the, the chateau owners and the merchants, people had been uh, making wines and it was quite 
common to, if you were had an order for a barrel of, say, Margot wine, uh, to top it up with something else. So in 1936, what they did was they drew geographical lines around regions based on a concept of terroir. Now, this is the first time we've heard this word. There is no English translation, but terroir is literally uh, starts with terre, the earth. It's the type of soil you have, but it's also the disposition. Are you flat? Are you along the riverbed? Are you on an incline? It's your climate, your microclimate. And it's also the human factor. How we prune the vines. Do we plant cover crops? All that kind of stuff is uh, involved today in this concept of terroir. But in 1936, they used this concept of terroir and the typicity or the character of the geographical area. So they drew lines around these geographical areas, like gerrymandering political districts in the US. They drew lines around these different areas, Margot, Pomerol, um, Grave, Sautern, and they, they set our rules and regulation. Now it's all about quality, keeping the quality of our wines high. So we know French, the French love rules and regulations. They put rules and regulations down for everything from the planting of the vines to the bottling. So uh, they tell us which grape varieties we can plant in, in which areas, how closely together we can plant the vines. They um, tell us how much sulfur we can use at every stage, uh, all the way up to the bottling. So these are all meant to uh, keep us with high quality wines. So that brings us up to today. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'll have further episodes on uh, appellations, on soil, on our grape varieties. And then maybe if you're, we're lucky, we'll get a few interviews from winemakers to find out what's going on in the Bordeaux Vineyard during this confinement. Um, and it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you for joining and please do share it with your friends if you enjoyed it. Bye bye.